The sheep and goat industries are rapidly growing segments of Missouri agriculture. The demand for these animals is based on their meat production. Consumers need to know more about cooking the meat and its nutritional benefits, and that's why tonight we'll take a look at lamb and Siobhan, their health benefits, and how best to prepare them, next on Show Me Egg. Welcome to Show Me Ag. I'm your host, Kyle Vickers. Thanks for joining us. Sheep and goat production is growing all over Missouri. We recently invited some producers to tell us their secrets to success, but we also want to touch on the nutritional benefits of both meats and demonstrate how easy they are to prepare. Today we're joined by Susan Jaster, who's with the Lincoln University Farmer Outreach Program, and Megan Webb, a nutrition and health educational specialist from the University of Missouri Extension Office. Thank you both for being with us. Susan, my dad uh, years ago told me that in any kind of livestock business, the, the three important things were, were genetics and health and nutrition. So what is there kind of a puzzle to put together if you want to get in the sheep and goat business? Well, it's like any other livestock. We do have to care for their health and, and make sure that they are um, comfortable uh, because if they're not comfortable, they're not working for us. And we need to make sure that uh, we try and put the best genetics in with our animals so that we have uh, good sires that can carry through those genetics that we need to have a, a healthy herd. It, it seems like to me with the sheep and goat industry, there aren't a lot of varieties of both uh, anymore and, and really for specific purposes and specific uh, demands. Yes, uh, we have in Missouri, we have wool sheep and hair sheep, and we also have several different kinds of goats. Some are uh, dairy goats and some are meat goats. So they have, we have a lot of uh, different varieties that we can use. I think most of us think in sheep, uh, when we think sheep, we think about wool and the you know, wool production, and that's really a declining thing. Uh, it's even hard to get rid of the wool. Well, for some producers it is, uh, you have to be ready to get on the shearer's list and make sure you have, uh, have him scheduled to come out to your farm in a timely manner when he's coming through the area so you don't spend too much money getting the sheep sheared. Um, most of the wool in Missouri goes for carpets because it's a little mm -hmm. bit lower quality. And, and what about hair sheep? Now this is something that's a little new to some of us. Uh, not, they don't have to be shorn. They, they have hair more like a cow or? It's uh, more, it's be similar to a dog's hair because they get a do, they do get a uh, undercoating of wool in the winter time, but they shed it off naturally in uh, about early summer. Which uh, is a good thing because they, you don't have to shear them, so they get ready. They get to get themselves ready for summer by shedding their longer hair. That's right. So let's talk about nutrition. I know a lot of people uh, believe that you can just turn goats and sheep out anywhere and they're going to be fine. It's really not quite that simple, is it? Not quite. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, the, the vegetation that the sheep and goats are going to be eating uh, have enough protein in it and um, they can get enough of the nutrition that they need from that variety. So if we just give them one type of vegetation like say fescue to eat, they're not going to be getting enough of the nutrition that they need. They need a variety. And, and But goats do have a reputation, uh, of course in the old cartoons they'd eat tin cans and so on. That's not quite true, but they do have a reputation for cleaning up some problem weeds and, and brush. Right, we like uh, goats to have uh, what we call browse, which would be woodier plants and um, the heavier different vegetations that are out there. And they will eat, uh, even eat tree bark um, if they don't have any other source of tannins like clover. And they will eat leaves off of trees. So they will defoliate if you're not careful. Uh, I've read that that's one of the things that they'll defoliate up about as high as they can reach standing on their hind legs. Is that's that right. about right? So if you've got a lot of underbrush, that might be a, an advantage. Uh, they even clean up Cerisa lespidiza, which is a known problem here. In... Cerisa lespidiza and poison ivy. Oh, wow. They well, love that. that. <laughs> that's great. And no ill effects from that. No, they're, uh, <laughs> they're immune to that part of the problem. And, and what about health? I do know that there, there are some real health concerns uh, because they're grazing, grazing closer to the ground and they have, so you have to have some regular treatment. It isn't something you can just let them go all year. 
Right, we need to be careful uh, because goats are not from uh, as high a moisture as we have here. Most goats are from the desert. So when we have a lot of rainfall, um, goats seem to uh, have a high, uh, high amount of uh, parasites. And so we have to be careful and, and check them for parasites. Sheep don't seem to have quite the problem, but they will, uh, they do need to be treated. Is that, you said treated, is that easy to deal with? Or is there some readily available uh, uh, solutions to that? If you'll check with your veterinarian, they can give you uh, the different types of dewormers that are available and uh, that are usable in your area. Now, here, here's another expression that I've heard. Any fence that will hold water will hold a goat. So uh, they do tend to, to uh, make an escape. What, what about fencing? That's a, that's a big issue. That is usually the limiting factor. Fences and uh, how we deliver water to our livestock and uh, goats do like to uh, escape. They, they, they'd rather be with people, so it's, uh, <laughs> they, we need to have good fences for them. So is it possible to make money? Can somebody do this on a part-time basis and make supplement, uh, supplementary income? Or can it, can it really be a full-time job if someone wants to, to really get after it? If you're willing to put in the management time that it takes, uh, it could be a full-time job. Uh, livestock is is still a money maker for a lot of people. Uh, live, any kind of livestock is uh, always a full-time job. Right. And so uh, I know you folks are working to, to help uh, with people who are new to the business and, and maybe even people that have been in it a while uh, to, to bring research out to the country. Tell us a little bit about your outreach program. Uh, Lincoln University's Innovative Small Farmers Outreach Program is helping people in the Kansas City area, the St. Louis area, and now in the Mount Vernon area, uh, down below Springfield, Missouri. And uh, we have lots of great information. Lincoln is doing uh, research on small ruminants now at on campus at our, our Busby Farm and also at the um, at our organic farm as well. Uh, so tell us a little bit, it, I mentioned earlier that, that it is very rapidly growing. What, what are you seeing across Missouri? Is it still a growing industry? Oh yes, uh, we have quite a few uh, farmers and ranchers getting into uh, raising sheep and goats. And um, as they've started less and less with beef, they are learning to feed livestock smaller ruminants. And so we have seen an influx of producers that are starting with sheep and goats. Mostly they just start with them as a way to clean up the browse that maybe the cows leave behind. And um, we're seeing them start into it as finding a new niche for their, for ways to sell meat. Okay, you just brought up the ne next point I was gonna bring up. What about marketing? I know there are some goat and sheep auctions around the state. There's some that go directly to uh, people who process them. Tell us a little bit about the marketing side of, of growing them. It is a little more difficult because it's not um, really the favorite meat that we have in Missouri, uh, but it's fast growing into another variety that you can use. Uh, lamb meat and goat meat are uh, being seen in grocery stores now. And um, when we have uh, producers that have quite a few sheep or goats, uh, a lot of them do sell to a, uh, a buyer. Uh, but many are selling uh, at the farmer's market, so they have a lot of direct sales, and uh, many producers sell right off the farm. Well, Megan, that brings me uh, kind of gone through the production side. You're a nutritionist and a health person. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the nutritional benefits of lamb and, and, and goat or Siobhan. Okay, well meat from goat and lamb or sheep is really a great way to add some variety into your diet and to your protein sources. Nutritionally, it is very similar to some of the other red meats. It's very similar to beef or pork. It's also very similar to chicken. A three ounce portion of any of those meats does contain between 23 to 25 grams of protein. Um, goat is actually going to be a little bit lower in calories and fat. Now, of course, that's going to depend on the cut of meat that we're talking about and how that uh, animal was, was raised, how, what it ate. Um, but on average, goat, I think again, a three ounce serving would average about 122 calories and around three grams of fat. 
whereas beef, pork, or lamb would be around 8 grams of fat and around 160 to 180 calories. Again, the protein content, though, is very similar among any of those. So you say a 3-ounce serving. Give us an idea of what that, that is in terms of size. Okay, so a 3-ounce serving, you could compare it to maybe the size of an iPhone or the size of a deck of cards. Okay, thank you. Before we go any uh, farther with this conversation, let's uh, see how to best prepare these two beets. We recently invited Miranda Urington, a member of the FFA from Cleveland, Missouri, to demonstrate how easy it is to cook both Siobhan and lamb. Welcome to the KMOS Kitchen. We're here with Miranda and Susan, and today we're going to be cooking with Siobhan and lamb, and we're going to begin with roast leg of goat, otherwise known as Siobhan. Miranda, I understand you raise goats and you've come up with a great recipe. Show us how to cook a great leg of goat. Okay, we're going to start out with a marinade for, this, for the goat leg that Susan and I created. We're going to start out with a half a cup of balsamic vinegar, a fourth cup of red wine vinegar, one rounded teaspoon of thyme, eighth of a teaspoon of white pepper, half a teaspoon of cayenne pepper, a half teaspoon of dry cilantro, or you could use fresh, and that would be six to seven stems of the leaves from six, six to seven stems of cilantro. An eighth cup of eighth dry teaspoon. Eighth teaspoon of dry mustard. Be a lot different than a teaspoon in the cup, so we need to get that straight. <laughs> yeah. And a half teaspoon of dry garlic. Come on now. And it's not wanting to work with me, but that is okay. We have other options. And a fourth teaspoon of vanilla. This happens to be clear vanilla, and you could use any kind, and it helps smooth out the flavors so they blend together nicely. Probably also smells good. Oh, yes. This is where we kick kicking up a notch. Uh, we got a, two tablespoons of whiskey here. If you don't feel like using whiskey, you can use lemon juice. And now for our last ingredient, it is two or three tablespoons of honey. Really makes it more sweet and it uh, gathers all the ingredients together and helps with the tenderness of our goat. Now we will whisk this all up. Honey makes everything better anyway. I think the sweetness and the flavor really is added. Now this is a uh, also, this helps the, the vinegar and so on. That acidity kind of helps tenderize the meat as well as add flavor. That's right. Uh, we, we find that uh, goat meat is not a very tough meat, but it can have, you have a little bit of sinew in there, and we also have the silver skin that we're going to show you how to trim let's, off. Let's show, uh, show folks how to do that. The silver skin is, is where it holds the muscle together, and so it is uh, a little bit shiny. You'll kind of get your knife under there, and get a little piece of it and cut through and then you're going to actually lift that up and cut it away and it helps if you have a fillet knife like this so that um, it's easier to get it off. That helps the marinade uh, penetrate a little better and, and as well uh, lets the meat loosen as it cooks. Right. You don't have to cut it all off, but just kind of loosen it up and, and you can score it a little bit like that to get um, some of that meat off. You've got a, a marinade bag ready and it's one of these double plastic bags because the bone in the, the uh, leg there might penetrate, so you've got a double bag. And then what's the next step? We're going to put the marinade in the bag first? Yes. I think that will work out better. We'll just pour that. This is where a handy assistant comes in here. Somebody hold that That's open. That's right. Okay. There you go, Susan. Thank you. Now we're going to take this leg of goat and kind of don't drop it. Just <laughs> gently angle it in there, and now we will seal that up. And then how, what do you do with this next? Uh, it marinates for what, a couple hours? Yeah. We'll shake it up good, and then... Well, how, how long do you need to marinate it? For a couple hours overnight. So. Two to th four hours if you don't have a lot of time, but it's better if you leave it overnight. And if every time you go into the fridge, if you will just uh, turn it and let that marinade kind of go all around the meat. So when the marinade time is up, then what's the next step? You got to get that roaster pan out? Then we're going to get the roaster and we will be uh, pouring that, putting the meat right in there. M meat and everything, yes. go, the marinade and the meat goes marinade together and, uh, and, and it's going to go ahead and cook in that product with yeah. a little bit of water. 
Yeah, right. we were going to cover the goat about two thirds to three fourths of the way. So. Now, how long water. do you cook? For, for the first two hours on 350 degrees, and then you'll check it every hour. And at the last two hours, it'll be 300 degrees, and that'll be about three and a half, four hours of bake time. And then let it set for a few minutes and it's ready to serve. We've got a sample over here. It looks delicious. I can't wait to dig in. We also have bangers and mash, which is made from goat sausage, and this happens to be cheddar and jalapeno sausage, and it would go great with garlic mashed potatoes and green beans. Well, this sounds delicious. I just can't wait to try it. We're here in the Came West Kitchen. We've cleaned up the Siobhan that we cooked, and now we're going to be cooking some lamb, several products uh, that we have, some lamb burgers, some chops, and a beautiful leg of lamb that we're going to roast. Uh, this is a beautiful piece of meat you've got. Yes, this is a uh, leg of lamb, and we've already mo removed all the silver skin from it so that it can be roasted, and uh, you're going to get ready to sear some of that for us. Okay, so what's the first step? So we'll want to add some olive oil in there, Miranda. Is that... Uh, and we've got the, the uh, pot here, the skillet, uh, on about a seven or eight. And uh, I'm supposed to brown this. Let me see if I can grab this with these tongs here. You might have to push the end in, Kyle, of the tongs. Whoops. Yeah, the end of the oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> here. Yeah, should have practiced with the tongs before we started. All right, let's give this a try. It's been giving our olive oil time to heat up. Oh, yeah. That's going to sizzle. And the purpose is, here is just get it brown on both sides. Is that the, the right. main? This is a two and a half to three and a half pound leg of lamb. And so you would want to sear that on all sides so that it becomes, it seals all the juice in. So it's really not a safety issue what we're doing right now to cook. We're just searing it to, to sear in the juices and allow for the marinade to work later right. on. Okay. This will be a braising liquid that Miranda's going to create for us here. So while you're, while Kyle's searing that for us, you're going to go ahead and mix that up. Yes. Uh, I have here three cloves of garlic, and we're going to go ahead and just dump all that in. And if you don't have fresh garlic, you can use three-fourths of a teaspoon of dry garlic. And I have a uh, three-fourths cup of red onion. We use red onion for mainly the color, and it's a sweeter onion, so a lot of people like sweeter with this goat re or this lamb re recipe. And we'll add one cup of red wine vinegar. So put a little bit of black pepper on there, just to give it a more seasoning, about eight turns in. And then a half teaspoon of salt, a rounded half teaspoon of cilantro, and again you can use fresh cilantro if you just would like. Just pull the leaves off the stems and, and maybe chop them a little bit. And next we have half. our half a teaspoon of cumin. And we'll clean this off. Stir it. And we'll mix it up. Kyle just about has it all browned all over. That's a technique called searing. They're just heating up that outside and that's skin. That's the olive oil. It's just the, the, the grease and that can... Uh, just enough to keep it from sticking in the okay. pan because this would be on a pretty high temperature. And so the next thing you do, after it's all brown, then we'll add the braising liquid into it. And, and along with the braising liquid, we'll add a little bit of jalapeno. You don't have to, if you do not like jalapeno, you don't have to do that. Right, it's an optional. And you can add as much as you like, two to three And is that going to continue to cook in this pot with all the, the ingredients that go yes, with it? Yes, we want the liquid to stay about an inch deep. So as it's cooking, we'll add a little bit of uh, water if, it's, if it cooks away, and that'll keep the flavor uh, into the, getting into the meat. I, I assume we have a lid for this. Yes, and so how we long would is this going to be? You're going to lower the heat in a little bit? We would put it in a 350 degree oven. So it's going to go off the top of the stove and into the right oven? Right into the oven, yes. Oh, that smells delicious. 
and you'll add that braising liquid and uh, after it comes back to a boil then we'll put the lid on and put it all in the oven and for about how long about two hours now we, what's the difference how's the taste difference between lamb and goat um, this would be a milder meat and the lamb would be much milder than the goat um, although goat as a young animal would be would still have a very complimentary sweet flavor right now this looks great and it smells wonderful thank you guys for sharing with us with us and sharing your recipe thanks for having us well uh, we really had a great looking product there it's uh, whetted my appetite susan and miranda did a great job of preparing that meat uh, megan meat has in my mind meat has a place in, in nearly everyone's diet talk to us a little bit in general about the meat product then we'll come back and talk more specifically okay a lot of people think of protein and meat as uh, the same thing and it is, but it's not. Uh, protein is one of the three macronutrients that we all need every day in our diet. Um, so we have protein, carbohydrates, and fat. And we all need those three things. There's many different ways to get protein in your diet, and meat is probably what people think of most often. It's also a complete protein, so that is important. Um, just like any meat, the goat and sheep, we want to make sure that we're getting a nice lean cut of meat. We want to uh, cut off any visible fat around the outside that we can possibly remove before cooking. We want to make sure we're eating the appropriate portion of all of our foods. So again, a serving size for a meat would be three to four ounces, again, the size of maybe an iPhone. Um, we also want to make sure that we're treating that meat in a safe way. As you know, uh, raw meats need to be refrigerated. When we're cooking those meats, we want to make sure that we cook it thoroughly. So anything that's ground, whether it's goat meat, whether it's chicken, whether it's beef, we want to make sure that that's cooked thoroughly, and that means cooked all the way through to 160 degrees. Anything that's not ground, like say um, a pork chop or a nice cut of goat or the leg, if it's not ground, it needs to be 145 degrees on the inside. And the only way to be sure that it's been cooked thoroughly is to use a meat thermometer. Uh, explain that to folks. I, I, I understand a lot of people want to overcook meat because there may be some nerves about that, but the ground meat, why is it more important to be sure that it's well done? Well, basically because during the process of grinding the meat and really tenderizing meat in any way, uh, we're taking whatever's on the outside of that meat. So if there's any bacteria on the outside of that, we're grinding it and removing it to the inside. Whereas on a cut of, like say, again, back to a pork chop or a steak, regardless of the meat source, whatever's on the outside is staying on the outside. And when we grind it or tenderize it, we're moving any contaminant on the outside, like bacteria, into the inside of that meat. So let's go back to the 145 degrees interior temperature mm -hmm. for most of these cuts, like we did the leg of lamb and, mm -hmm. and leg of goat. That's a critical temperature for the inside. That assures you that uh, and there's no problems there. Right, that anything that could cause you a problem has been killed during the cooking process, yes. So are, is there anything, I mean, it's, it's a little bit unusual. Sheep and goats are just a little bit, most of us are used to, you know, chicken and, and beef or pork. Mm -hmm. uh, is there anything that is peculiar to sheep and goat meat that we need to watch for in terms of food safety? Just thoroughly cooking that product, making sure that it's refrigerated just as you would with, with beef, really. Um, after you've cooked the food, once it's been served and eaten within a two hour time period, we really need to get it back in the refrigerator. So what about the, the initial preparation? I know uh, the slow, slower cooking, uh, but also be very careful in terms of bringing that out of a freezer or something like that uh, and how you, how you get ready to uh, cook the meat. Yeah, for any meat, uh, preparation is very important. So if we are starting with something that came from the freezer, we want to make sure that we thaw that in a safe way. And the best way to thaw a meat then is in the refrigerator. If we leave it out on the countertop, it can actually kind of get into the danger zone of temperatures, um, which is a, which 40 to 140 degrees. And that's where those bacteria can grow a lot quicker in that temperature range. So the safest way to thaw something is in the refrigerator. Also, we want to prevent cross-contamination. That's a, a big thing that people are concerned about and well should be. Um, by that I mean we want to use different utensils on raw meat than we're using on cooked meat. We want to use different cutting boards um, for raw meat and cooked meat and for raw meat and say if you're cooking a vegetable to go with your meat you want to make sure you're using different utensils for all of those types of things. Uh, serving dishes if you're have the raw meat on a dish and take it to the oven or the grill. Um, make sure that that is either thoroughly washed with soap and warm water or um, a whole new dish used as well. 
What are you seeing in terms of, of um, health? We, we occasionally hear of E. coli scares and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Are we making progress in that regard or are we going the wrong direction? You know, I think the key to that is just education and awareness to have people be aware that it is a problem. E. coli is everywhere, as are a lot of bacteria, and so we need to be aware of how to manage that instead of just thinking it shouldn't be there <laughs> because it is naturally occurring. Um, so we just need to make sure that we're cooking our foods thoroughly, that we're washing all of our cooking surfaces, and that we're not cross-contaminating. And then watch that temperature. What about uh, as part of a, a diet, uh, um, and I, I tell Diet, not in terms of a, a way to lose weight, but diet in terms of overall nutrition. Yeah. How does how does the sheep and goat fit into a plan like that? Well, again, we would consider it a protein source. Uh, it doesn't have to be meat to get your protein from, but we all do need protein. Um, 10 to 35 percent of our daily caloric intake should be from a protein source. Uh, we also want to encourage people to try to vary those protein sources including something like goat meat or lamb or sheep is a wonderful way to, to vary those protein sources. Other sources of protein, of course, would be um, beef, pork, chicken, also um, beans, soybeans, some grains have protein as well, uh, quinoa, for example, um, but just to make sure that we are getting an adequate amount of protein in our diet, and most Americans are. And, and Susan, let's go back to the growing. You mentioned uh, the, a lot of people are using them in pasture situations for rotation and, and maybe for gleaning some of the, the brush down. Tell us a little bit about, about that. Well, many of our producers uh, are using uh, pasture management and they are also uh, doing a rotational grazing. And so when they do that, that gives the animals a lot more variety. There will be some weeds in there, there'll be some uh, heavy brush, some woody uh, vegetation, and they can get protein out of a lot of that. In fact, uh, many of our weeds in Missouri have higher protein than the actual uh, products that we feed them uh, from the mill or uh, that we grow as a grain crop. I've, I've read that you can run cows and then in a rotational program run sheep and goats behind them and, and not take anything away from the cows and in fact improve your pastures, but the sheep and goats will eat things that the cows won't. That's right. Uh, many producers will, will do a rotational grazing that way and um, follow either before or after the cattle so that they're cleaning up those weeds and um, they can, because cows don't always chew all the seeds up. The sheep and goats will chew up to around 95 to 98 percent of the seeds and so they're not being returned onto the pasture so that keeps the weeds down. In fact you'll probably have to plant more types of vegetation so that there is a variety, yeah, variety. in the in the future. For so if somebody's interested in this again help us out with a little bit about how they would contact, who they would contact to get some help. Yes, Lincoln University has a cooperative extension program and it, uh, we have a uh, innovative small farmers outreach program that helps our smaller producers and they can contact us through Lincoln University Extension. And available on the internet, I'm on sure, the internet, to get yes. context. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for tonight. I'd like to say thanks again to Susan Jaster and Megan Webb for being with us tonight and to Miranda Yearington for joining us in the kitchen to share her delicious recipes. But before we go, we'd like to also thank you, our viewers, for tuning in to Show Me Ag. And we hope you'll tune in next time for another look at a topic touching rural Missouri. For everyone here at CAMOS and myself, good night. We're also very interested in what you have to say. So if you have feedback you'd like to share with us, you can email us at showmeag at camos.org or find us on Facebook 